evening. Glad you're with us tonight. Let me uh, get this set up, send it to a few people, and then we'll get started. Hope you all have had a good week and uh, you've enjoyed your weather. Uh, it seems like around the world right now, or at least around the eastern United States, we're getting some wild weather. And let's see, here we go. Boy, the internet's slow tonight. Hey, Flynn's glad you're on. Hey, Betty and Cheryl, glad you're on as well. My family's on. Woohoo! It's nice to know that they still pay attention to me. Hey, Marilyn, Norm. God bless you. Good to see you as well. And let's see. And one more. And there we go. It's nice I got to keep sending this to people. Uh, number of cricket keeps growing every, every week. All right. Let's see. Hey, Clarence. Glad you're on, bud. <laughs> I would say get an ice cream, but uh, with the weather the way it is, you might not want to. I love their ice cream. You get their small and, it, you know, it's massive. Uh, well, let's open up in a word of prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you look over your children and that you have us in the palm of your hand. We are so humbled that you love us so much. Lord, as we open your word tonight, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into our lives to help us to understand your word a little better and help us to apply it. Help us to apply the truth of it, that we can walk closer to you the more, you, the closer the way you would have us to walk. Help us tonight. Be with those that are uh, in our church that are sick. Lord, we think of many that um, we've been having on our prayer request list, some unspokens, and Lord, we just ask that you would uh, bring a special touch of healing on them or that you would answer the prayer of their hearts. Uh, in each and every one, in each and every circumstance. We leave them in the palm of your hands because it's the situations are way too out of our control, but they're not out of yours. And we trust you to take care of your children. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Grandma, glad, glad to see you on. Glad you made it. All right, we are in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 19. <laughs> I really hope that we make it through chapter 6 tonight. If we don't, I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. Uh, but this, I believe, is the fourth time we have been in Matthew chapter 6. And so let's read through uh, verses 19 through 34, and then we'll go back and talk about uh, what each verse um, is talking about. Verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust and where thieves, moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be filled with darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your father feeds your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore don't worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, verse 19, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. As we've been going through um, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been giving, he's been giving uh, idea and challenge that's more worried about the heart of the issue than the fruit. Or we could say it this way, he's more worried about the root of the problem than the fruit of the problem. <laughs> make, does that make it any clearer? I don't know. He's challenged them in ways that they've never understood before. They've not heard preaching and teaching like this. And some of the things he said is, has astonished them. And this too astonishes them. In the culture in which they live, everything was for show. Everything was to put good on your account so that you look better and you look more holy and that everyone recognizes that you're holy. But that's not Jesus' concern. In fact, he deters them from living those kind of lifestyles. He's worried about how their heart is, the condition of their heart that would lead to the fruit in their life. And we'll talk more about that actually at the beginning of chapter 7, <laughs> hopefully next week. From what he says here, he says, don't lay up treasures for yourselves on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. It is very apparent from Jesus' own words that there will be rewards in heaven. Hey, Steve, glad you're on. Good to see you. There will be rewards in heaven. We don't all get the same in heaven either. It's not like we all get, you know, a house or a mansion, whatever you want to call it, in this um, block of homes that all look the same. No, we're all going to receive different, and it's all based on what we've done in this life that, that determines our eternal rewards. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 12, we will all give account of ourselves to God. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 10. By the way, I have all of these verses uh, in the description if you want to follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We all will receive according to what we've done in this life, in this body, whether good or bad. So how do you invest for eternity? If we can lay up treasures in heaven, and if we can... Hey, Beverly, glad to see you on. If we can do things in this life that will impact our rewards in heaven in the future, how do we do that? What would it look like? Well, for that, I want to go to 1 Corinthians, and there's other passages too, but just for tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 9 through 15. Paul, talking to the church at Corinth, says, For we are, all, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. 
According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds it. Pay attention to how you're living your life, in other words, how you're building your spiritual house. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will become clear. For the day, the day of judgment, the day of the Bema Seat, will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will have his he will receive his reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. Paul says here, our work, our reward is based on Christ. Period. This is the foundation. This is what we lay. And that's what we will be judged by. We will be judged how we have dealt with the kingdom of God and what we're doing for it. That's what Paul says here. So what are you doing to serve God and to love God now to invest in your eternal future? Now, I'm not saying that these things save you. They do not. These are those that are already saved. But what you do after you are saved accounts towards your reward. Many people build careers, properties, cars, power, wealth, retirements. But like Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes, the end of all of these things, and he had them all, is all vanity. It all ends up to be nothing. It's all just a fleeting vapor that's left to somebody else that doesn't appreciate it like we do. All of your work and all of your stockpile is wasted because you pass it on to somebody else. Down here, people forget or they don't appreciate what you do, your efforts. <laughs> when you get your paycheck, right? Taxes eat up most of what you bring in. <laughs> before you ever get it, before you ever see it, before you can ever enjoy it, that man, those taxes are already gone. Brand new cars, they dent quickly. Brand new carpet is a magnet for a three-year-old with grape juice. Ask me how I know. Beauty wrinkles quickly and muscles grow weak. A whole lot faster than we'd like to admit, right guys? But you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It does if it's all about this life. Hey, Ivy? Wow, it's been years. It does have to be that way if everything is focused on this life. But if it's focused on eternity, it doesn't have to be that way. You can take it with you if you invest it correctly. If you invest into God's kingdom today, if you stop building for this life and start building for that one, the dividends are out of this world. <laughs> thought that was a good pun. It was intended. It's out of this world. Stop building for what's down here that's going to be gone in an earthquake. It's going to be gone in one day, one day of bad stock trading. Invest. Invest in what lasts. You know, I've known a lot of financially poor people, I guess is the best way to put it. And they've invested in my life, and I've never forgot them. And you know what? One of these days, I get to see them for eternity. And I still won't forget them. You know, as my, grand, as my mom's dad passed away this last year, as we're standing around him singing hymns and, and, and praying and praising the Lord, ushering him into heaven, I couldn't help but think of my grandpa Bud waiting on the other side of that eternal veil, waiting to give him a hug. Because it was through their relationship that my grandpa Miller found the Lord. There's a whole lot of people like that song says by Ray Boltz that I get to say thank you to. 
they invested in my life. They spent, not, maybe not of their worldly goods, but they spent of time and effort and struggle and invested in me. And it's changed me forever. So instead of investing in this life, why don't we take some time off and invest in the people that are here around us now? Why don't we take some time off and invest in our relationship with God that we have now? It could be as little as a cup of cold water in his name. I love to give hugs. It's just one of those things, it's who I am. Uh, people need to be touched. They need to be loved. They need to know that you care. And me as a person, I love, and I try to be cautious when I do, but I do. I try to show them that I care about them by giving them hugs. I do more, I try to do more than just say it with words. I do it because I'm giving part of my heart, I'm showing my heart to them. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy showing my love. But you know what's really cool? And I didn't really I wouldn't didn't really think about it until I was actually working on this tonight. Every hug that I've ever given out of love, it's been recorded. Every prayer that I've prayed, every tear that I've shed, every kind word, every smile, every joke that lifts a person's day, they're all recorded. And by from what Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, oops, I might have forgot to put that one in there. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, by what it says, whatever I plant, I reap. I'm storing up all of these things that I enjoy doing now to receive as a reward in eternity. That, that amazes me. How are you impacting the kingdom of God today? What are you investing? I have no hopes of retirement in my stocks. You know why I don't have any hopes in those? It's not because of the economy and I have fears of it. No, <laughs> I don't have any hopes for my retirement. Hey, David, glad to see you on, buddy. I don't have any hopes in my retirement because I haven't invested hardly anything. My stocks and bonds are worthless because I haven't put any effort into them. You know, that should be a warning to us for eternity, shouldn't it? We can't be disappointed later if we haven't planted today. Jesus goes on, verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, as we've talked about this previously, and we've mentioned it many times because I've wanted to make this a point, this Sermon on the Mount is not about the fruit of your life. It's about the root of your life. It's about your heart. And Jesus takes all of this information and he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We, our hearts, where our hearts are focused is where we invest our time, our talents, our treasures, as David would have said, or does say, <laughs> since he's on, I'll pick on him. It's how we invest is where our heart's at. If our heart's in people and God's kingdom, that's where we invest. If our hearts are in our retirement, that so one day we can get done with work after we're exhausted from work and be able to enjoy life, that's where we invest. If we're trying to spend our life, we're spending much time working so that we can make a better life for our kids than what we had growing up. That's If that's where our heart's at, that's where our investment is. Hey, Diane, glad to see you. Good to have you on. Where you invest, where you invest shows where your heart is. What investments you're making today proves the dividends that you will have for eternity. 
So where's your heart? Hey, Junior. Glad you're on as well. Good to see you, buddy. Verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light... Hey, Uncle Ken, good to see you on. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I, I love big, huge windows in a home. And I love to have the curtains drawn and so the sun shines in. My wife likes big, huge, nice curtains. Hey, Carol, glad to see you on. My wife likes big curtains. You know, when you marry somebody, you usually marry the opposite, right? And so she loves these big curtains and then I can't see out the windows. Jesus kind of makes that same inference here. If your eyes are good, you get to see and your whole body is filled with light. But if your eyes are bad, if, if you've got curtains over your eyes, your heart, your whole life is filled with darkness. Most of you know I'm colorblind. Not completely, but mostly colorblind. <laughs> By the book, at least I'm halfway colorblind uh, for the study or the tests that you do. Most times I can find humor in it. But in times when I'm more serious, I do really wonder what everybody else is seeing. I wonder what I'm missing. I can't imagine someone having, like Greg that's on, who has a wonderful vision for colors and, and can see different colors. I can't imagine someone like that wanting and giving up what they have to have what I have. I can't imagine that. I can't wait till heaven and I get to see the beautiful colors of heaven. But you know what? People do it every single day. They fill their eyes and their body with terrible things. If you, if you are watching, if you are looking at things that are bad, your entire body, by what Jesus says, will be bad. If you, what you look at is good and uplifting and pleasing, then your body will be filled with what's good, uplifting, and pleasing. Normally, I'm really too busy to spend much time on social media of any sort. And if I do anything, it's usually on Facebook. I, I, I've tried to branch out, but I'm just, I don't have the time. But this week, because of a COVID scare at the kids' school, the kids have been home with me. And I've been watching them instead of working. So I've had more time to be on social media. And you know what? I had to stop. I was getting so depressed and it just a world that's so divisive and I had to put it down because it, it was just disturbing me. I'm sit we're as the church, we're sitting here in the middle and we're trying to be like Jesus mentions earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, we're trying to be peacemakers in this world of division and man, it's just sometimes it's just hard. So I had to put it down. If you fill your eyes with bad things, your whole body will be filled with bad. But if you fill your eyes with good things, your whole body and mind will be filled with the good. Verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will... Be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Hey, Martin. Glad to see you, buddy. Glad to see you on. What's Jesus saying in verse 22 and 23 in context? It seems, because verse 21, he's talking about treasure. And he's talking about where we invest it in 20 and before that. Then he says something about this lamp as an eye, or your eye as a lamp, and then he goes on to talk about money again. The word mammon there does mean money. So in context, what is he saying? It seems almost out of place. If you take 20 and 21, where he's talking about treasure on heaven and earth. He's splitting the two differences. He's, he's saying you're either paying attention and working, investing for what's down here, or you're doing it for what's up here. Then you go down to verse 24, and he says you're either serving God up here, or you're serving money down here. If your eye is good, you're going to focus 
on heaven's treasure. You're going to be focused on what's coming. If your eye's good, you're going to be focused on God. But if your eye's bad, you're going to be looking for the treasures of this world, of this earth. You're going to be investing in this life. If your eye's bad, you're going to serve the money of this world. We need to carefully evaluate how we invest our time and our money and our efforts. Because it's going to have an eternal impact in our life. When we look at how, if you were to take your life and you, and you focus on how you spend all of your time, how you spend all of your money, and you wrote it down in a chart and you looked at it, what would it say, what would that fruit say about the root of your heart? We need to evaluate it. Because if all we're focused with is what we're having right here, we've got nothing for up there. People are worried about their retirements, and man, I mean, you should be, kind of. It's kind of a mess out there in the economy. So you work, and, and you you squirrel money away, and you try to invest it, and you try to put it there, so that when you come to retirement, you, you've got something there. More importantly, we need to be ta paying attention about eternity. That we need to make sure we've got something there when we get there. Verse 25. These will come quicker. Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet our your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? He's asking a question that he expects them to answer to. That yes, the birds are more important to him than us. Uh, we're more important to him than the birds. I should say that correctly, right? Uh, he didn't die for the bird's salvation. He died for ours. In today's world, that gets a little constrained you know, messed up, and we need to remember that he died for our sins, right? But I will keep going. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit or 18 inches to his stature? I always wanted to make it six foot. You know what I did? I got to like 5'10", 5'10 and a half, somewhere in there. It's probably going to get shorter the older I get and keep creeping down, but I always wanted to make it to six foot. John that I work with, my friend, he's like 6'3". And we have constant banter that, man, if I could have ever made it to six foot and he'd go up and he'd reach the ceiling and put mud on the ceiling and, you know, tease me about it. Yeah, I'd love to be able to make it six foot. Never could. So why worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God clothes the grass of the field, which is today and is tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Jesus, in verse 25, uses that word therefore again. Anytime Jesus is speaking, he uses the word therefore. He's taking what he has said, and he's digging a little deeper into it. And he's trying to pull out this idea and, and blossom it a little bit. He's expanding the thought. In this case, he's talking about money. Have a good eye and serve God. Store up treasures in heaven, in the eternal where it's secure. Don't worry about serving money down here. God takes care of all of that. He knows what you need. Poverty here doesn't mean poverty up there. Aren't you glad? Woohoo! The way you store up there is by investing what you have down here into an eternal bank. As we mentioned before, everything counts. Everything invested into God's kingdom now is an investment in heaven with guaranteed dividends. And they're out of this world. Verse 31. Therefore, he says it again, do not worry. Same word. It's don't get anxious. Don't ha have anxiety 
over what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear. For after all of these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these. Just think with me for just a moment. How much time do you spend on trying to pick out clothes, ladies? Oh, I mm, shouldn't say that. Some of us guys are guilty of it, too. How much time do you spend on picking out the clothes to wear? How much time do you spend working a little extra so that you can buy the designer clothes? How about the time that you spend looking at menus? Some of us are like, yeah, we know what we want to eat. We're going to get that. And then some of us are, man, you know, I could have this or I could have this. And it takes you 15 minutes. The waitress has to come back two or three times. How, many, how long do you spend each and every day trying to decide what to cook for that night's supper? Working overtime, trying to have a better life for your kid than what you had growing up. All of these things. Every single one of them. Jesus says, this is what the world struggles with. You don't have to. You're a king's kid. You know, in feudal times... The king and the queen got served first. But you know who was next? Their kids. Everybody else in the country, they could let them eat cake, right? Marie? No. The king's kids got to eat first. Because the king cared about his kids. Or at least most of them did. <laughs> We're the kids of the God of the universe. All creation... He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the taters in them, right? As the phrase goes. He knows what you need before you even ask. So stop worrying like the rest of the world does. Stop running the rat race. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Verse 33. This is a promise by Jesus. This is something you can hold Him to. This is a proviso. This isn't Peter, Paul, or Mary giving you promises for you older ones that wouldn't know who they are. No. This is Jesus making the promise. He says, if you take care of this one thing, if you take care of my kingdom and my righteousness, if you take care of that, I'll take care of everything else. Hold me to it. It's a promise. If he can't keep this promise... Verse 34, therefore don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And this is hard in our time, isn't it? This word worry that we've heard several times in this little passage, these few verses, it's the same word for anxiety. And anxiety is a problem in our world today. I read an article today from back in October of 2020, and this is what it said. Everyone experiences stress and anxiety at one time or another. The difference between them is that stress is a response to a threat in a situation. Anxiety is the reaction to the stress. If you don't know how to handle the problems that come in your life, it overtakes you. And Jesus is saying, don't let it overtake you. Yes, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In the same article, these are some of the stats. It was really surprising. Anxiety disorders are among the most common uh, mental illness in the, inside the United States. It affects 40 million adults. That's 18.1% of the population. There's about 15 of us watching right now. 20% of us deal with anxiety by these numbers. People, get this, people with an anxiety disorder are three to five times more likely to go to the doctor. And they're six times more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders than those who don't suffer from anxiety. But here's the deal. 
18% of us don't react well to the stress that's in our life, and that's the problem. And it makes us three to five times more likely to go see a doctor and six times more likely to be hospitalized. Why? Because we can't do what Jesus says in verse 34. We don't know how to deal with the stress that's in front of us. Jesus said, leave it up to me. Plain and simple. He didn't go through this huge program. This, no. He said, leave it up to me. I know what you need before you ask. So don't worry about it. I've got you in the palm of my hand. We have so many things that we can worry about today. And this, our news doesn't help anything. Everything's a disaster. Rush to the toilet paper aisle, everybody, in 2020, right? As I speak right now, here comes the ice apocalypse to Kentucky, right? Oh, no, we might not have power for a week. You know what? Even if we don't, we're going to survive. We'll make it through. The world hasn't had electricity that many years. <laughs> Long before this, they didn't have electricity. Maybe we, it's not going to be comfortable. We might not enjoy it. We might not be well prepared for it, but we'll survive it. Albert Einstein once said that God doesn't play dice. You know why God doesn't play dice? He'd win every time. Either he would change the dice as they fall to make them fall on what he wants, or he'd know what they were going to hit when they hit the table, and he'd win every time. God doesn't play dice. I heard a funny story this week. So last Sunday night was Super Bowl Sunday, and, and apparently there was a streaker um, that went out on the field. I didn't see it, so I don't know. But there was a street. There was a streaker, and uh, what actually happened? He had set up bets with betting agencies prior to the Super Bowl, betting at, I think, 750 to 1 or some crazy odd that there would be a streaker on in the Super Bowl. And he invested like $50,000 into this bet and ended up, after one night in jail, because he obviously got caught, he cleared like $374,000 or some astronomical amount. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not... I'm not condoning streaking. I'm not condoning betting. I'm using this as a point, all right? It wasn't much of a bet for him because he already knew that there was going to be a streaker because he was going to be the one to do it. For him, it wasn't a bet. You know what? Everything that we face in life, no matter how minute, or how, ma how major, God's seen it all. It's not a surprise to him. When he says, if you take care of my kingdom and my righteousness, and I'll take care of everything else, he meant it, because he doesn't play dice. We don't need to be anxious about tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. We don't need to be anxious about it. Because we know who holds our hand. One of my favorite hymns is I don't know who holds tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow. Wow. Couldn't have messed that up any worse. I read the first line. <laughs> I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry about the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today, I'll walk beside him, because he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know about tomorrow. It may bring me poverty. 
But the one who feeds the sparrows is the one who stands by me. And the path that is my portion may be through a flame or a flood, but his presence goes before me. And praise God, I'm covered by his blood. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter. As the golden stairs I climb, every burden's getting lighter. Every cloud is silver lined. The, there the sun is always shining. There no tear will dim the eye. At the ending of the rainbow, where the mountains touch the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We don't have to worry about who's going to be taking care of us. We're a king's kid. He's not going to let us drop out of his hand. Romans chapter 8, towards the end of it, again, I've said it many times, favorite book, favorite chapter out of that book. There's a whole list of things that Paul says that I've been through. It's been rough in life, but there's one constant. The place where I sit. And it's in the palm of his hand that Satan and all of his minions can't pull me out of. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God bless you. May he give you peace in your day, whether it be this evening as the ice apocalypse comes, whether it be tomorrow, next week, or next year. May you not worry because you know who holds your hand. God bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are in your hands and that your hand is big enough not only to carry all of us, but it's big enough to carry me. And that you've made the promise as I focus on you and as I focus on your kingdom, you've taken care of everything else that we need. And you've also promised that everything that I do in this life that's focused on your kingdom has a dividend that won't be destroyed by moth or rust one bad stock market day or an earthquake. It's invested forever in heaven with dividends that are out of this world. I am humbled that you think so highly of me. We worship you tonight. We don't trust in our own efforts. We don't trust in our money. We don't trust in our jobs. We trust in you and you alone. We don't trust in our president or our congressman. No. We look to you for salvation and you alone. And we lay ourselves in your hands and say wherever you lead we will follow through shady green pastures wherever you may lead us we will eat at your feet and drink from the brook that you've brought us next to because next to you is the only place that's safe for us the sheep we love you and we want no other place to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us.